All right, guys, listen, I am taking a moment to step away from church. I'm in between services right now to make this video. As you can tell, there are no pre-production things, no intros, anything like that. I just wanted to talk about what the current state of affairs are in Israel because we're in a very, very serious moment. And I think it's really important to give you a little bit of biblical background, explain where I'm coming from when I say the things that I say, because what I hope to do is give you a really good solid update as into where we are in the current moment and where things are actually going, because all of these matters are really, really serious. Now, I want to first start off by simply saying that the leader of Hezbollah is dead. Now, that also means that all of his commanders are dead. And every single major leader within the Hezbollah organization is dead. Uh, it's also safe to say that within Hamas, it's pretty much a destroyed organization as well. It's still well on its way to needing a little bit more loose ends to be tied up. But what's happened here is Iran has lost their crown jewel. They are in a state of disarray right now, very, very likely to respond with great retaliation against Israel. Uh, I think the only reason why they won't do that immediately is probably because Khomeini is scared for his life, which rightly so he should be. There's a lot of other interesting variables that go with this. I would venture to say that all of Asia Minor is in disarray. The southern portion of the Arabian Peninsula is completely mad. The United States of America has gone absolutely crazy in the way that they're choosing to handle what's going on here. And I'm going to put all of this together for you, by the way. The North African portion uh, of the area that touches the Mediterranean is also in disarray. I'll talk about that in just a second. And I would even include Egypt in that because of all of the things that have happened. Turkey is pretty much going insane. We'll talk about why that's important in just a minute. I'm going to get into all of this here pretty quickly because I hope to sort of put it all together in one big piece of geopolitical analysis for you because I think it's important. And then I want to also talk about what is currently happening and where we're going. I'm also going to read something very interesting to you that was written by a friend of ours, Mike Duran. I think he's a really wonderful man. Um, I don't know Mike personally. I hope to know him soon, but I do know Gadi Taub uh, personally, who's a dear friend and somebody that I have come to love and admire, who's very close to Mike, and they do a show together called Israel Update. I would highly encourage you to go there. There's some really good stuff that they do. The one thing that I want to talk about is where we are and the current state of affairs that we're seeing. Now, before I do that, I want to read Ezekiel 38 to you, or at least a portion of Ezekiel 38. And this is important. I'm not going to put it up on the screen because I'm just recording this on the fly, but you should follow it. If you've got a Bible, you can open it. I'm reading it out of the King James. Let me just simply read the first part of Ezekiel 38 for you. It says this, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Of course, when we talk about Gog, Gog is presumably a title. My guess is he is the, well, is a title for sure. Presumably he's the leader of Russia. Uh, the land of Magog is all of those areas where you see the stands, you know, Turkmenistan, you know, all those areas. And that whole region uh, right there in that area. And when we start talking about this prophecy, this, of course, is going to be related directly to Israel. So it goes on to say, And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, and all of them handling so, all of them handling swords. Now, many of you might stop at this point and say, James, are you reading the beginning of Ezekiel 38? Is what's happening in Israel that right now? And the answer to that is absolutely not. And that's not the reason why I'm reading Ezekiel 38, because the beginning of Ezekiel 38 um, is going to bring us a background as into what I do need to discuss or what I want to discuss, because this is uh, critically important for our learning here. So look what it goes on to say. It says in verse 5, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, and all of them with shield and helmet. Gober, uh, Gober, 
<laughs> Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarma of the North Quarters and all his bands and the many people with these. So that's Turkey. Okay. So you're talking about Persia. This is Iran, uh, Ethiopia, Libya, same countries as we know them today. We're talking about Turkey that's involved in this. It says, be thou prepared and prepare thyself thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee and be thou a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter days thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell, notice this, safely, all of them. That's what I want to focus on. And thou shalt ascend and come like a storm and thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and thy bands and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that in the same time shall things come into thy mind that thou shalt think an evil thought, notice this, and shalt say, I will go up into the land of what? Unwalled villages. It's referring to Israel as a land of unwalled villages, okay? We don't know that Israel now. It says, and I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Folks, this is talking about Israel not having bars or gates, not having walls. We're not there yet. So Ezekiel 38 can't happen until that happens, but there's a reason why I'm bringing this up, okay? Because what this draws out for us is something remarkable. It's basically showing us that when the attack of Ezekiel 38 happens, Israel will be in complete and total peace. It will not just only be in peace, but it will be in complete security and safety when it happens. And so in verse 12, it says they're going to take spoil and to take prey, to turn thine hand upon desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold and take away cattle and goods and to take spoil? This is an amazing picture because what this is also telling us in Ezekiel 38 is that Saudi Arabia will be amongst one of the nations that objects to the attack of Israel by Russia and all the other nations that join. So a couple of things we know have to happen, and that's why I'm going to get into this because this is important, okay? Israel has to be a complete and total peace. Not only does Israel have to be a complete and total peace, but also Saudi Arabia has to be close friends with Israel. Now, what are we learning right now? We know that Israel can't be at peace unless Hezbollah is eliminated. We know that Israel can't be at peace until Hamas is eliminated. We know that Israel can't be at peace until the leader of the Palestinian Authority is actually eliminated and all of the wickedness that follows that organization is eliminated as well because they also call for the destruction of Jews. So we're in a very complex situation where we have not seen all of these things happen yet, but folks, open up your eyes because today and yesterday and the day before yesterday and the last 10 days, we have watched significant strides being made towards that very thing happening. So with all that said, we also know in Zechariah chapter 12 that the world is going to come against Israel. They're all going to gather themselves around Jerusalem, which of course I believe is part of this discussion that relates directly to what we're reading in Ezekiel 38 and the geopolitical environment necessary in order to get there. So all of this stuff is super significant. All of this stuff is really remarkable. And then we get ourselves to 10 days ago. Now, this is important because 10 days ago, and I've spent some time talking about this, Israel executes what may be the most incredible and sophisticated operation where they blew up pagers that only terrorist leaders owned and they took out a whole bunch of them, permanently injured many of them, and uh, it created a panic within the realm of all of the ranks of Hezbollah. Then the next day, they blow up these walkie-talkies, and in doing so, it really puts the fear of God into all of these people, and quite frankly, it gets to the point where in a panic, 
all of the Hezbollah commanders meet in one uh, area. And when that happens, Israel comes down and basically blows that building up and all of those commanders die. The only one left that's alive that's of any real significance is uh, Nasrallah, and Nasrallah happens to be killed just a few days ago. Now, I should stop and talk about the sophistication of what happens with these pagers. As a matter of fact, as I said before, Mike Duran wrote this. I think what he writes is really, really incredible because what he writes is powerful, it's accurate, and it's very specific to the issue related to the pagers and to the walkie-talkie. So let me bring this up to you. I'm going to read this to you. It says this, and I love what he writes here. I think it's really, really powerful. He says, a few thoughts on the operation, uh, or a few thoughts on Operation Grim Reaper. Uh, he's referring to the pagers and the, um, and the walkie-talkies. Number one, this is one of the most astonishing intelligence operations in history. It is a reworking of the story of the Trojan horse for the digital age, and it deserves to become nearly as legendary as its iconic predecessor. If we are not utterly astounded, it is because we have seen too many James Bond and Black Mirror movies for our own good. In real life, operations like this just don't happen. It is at least four operations in one. And he's right. At the bare minimum, it's four operations in one. Look what he says. He says, first, the Israelis thoroughly mapped Hezbollah's supply chain. Second, they invented a special explosive charge small enough to be inserted inside a handheld device, sophisticated enough to be remotely activated, and big enough to do real harm, and yet not to uh, prominent physically or electronically to call attention to itself or not so prominent physically or electronically to call attention to itself. By the way, you saw a picture of how this pager works with that video that's been floating around with what happened in that um, grocery store where that Hezbollah terrorist was there and um, it affected him and severely injured him, but didn't even touch the grapes that he was a foot away from. So very interesting thing. Third, he says, the Israelis turned themselves into a big enough link in uh, turned itself into a big enough link in Hezbollah's procurement network to take a physical control over the devices and rig them. Fourth, they activated the charges simultaneously and across every wide graphic area. That's pretty true, and it's a pretty heavy thing. Any one of these sub-operations had been botched, the operation as a whole would have fizzled, and who else in the world could pull off such an imaginative, technically sophisticated, and audacious plot? And the answer to that question is very, very obvious, and Mike is absolutely right. This is undoubtedly Israeli ingenuity. This is something that they did that is unheard of, as uh, Mike just noted here, and I think it's a very, very important notation that he's making. It is completely unprecedented. It is something that we have never heard of, and of course, it brings a lot of remarkable picture to us. Now, with that, what ends up happening are a series of attacks come from the Yemeni Houthis. We know that as of the moment that I'm talking right now, Israel has actually attacked the Houthis, even though I should point this out, the Houthis uh, aggressively attacked the United States in the Red Sea, uh, 40 missiles just uh, literally not even 24 hours ago against assets in the Red Sea. And a few days prior to that, in, during the week, there was also another attack by the Yemeni Houthis against the United States of America. And yet the United States of America has sat still. They're choosing not to do anything about it. They're just very like, this is the way it's going to be, and that's all. And we're going to try to make peace and whatever baloney that they're trying to do. But the reality of it is they're not. They're actually warmongering instead of making peace, which brings us to a whole other issue. And that is what has happened, okay? Plain and simple, the Yemeni Houthis have done what they've done. Israel has attacked Yemen yet again. That's a very, very important uh, consideration to make because they, in essence, are doing the very thing that the United States of America should have done. And then when you add to it, you have a situation where the bunker busters hit Nasrallah's house. You have a very complicated set of circumstances that led to them being able to physically verify the fact that Nasrallah's body is what it is, and they all know what's actually going on. And now we have a series of headlines that are absolutely remarkable. Lebanon on the verge of catastrophe as the body of Hezbollah leader is recovered intact. That's one of the big headlines right now that you'll see in Sky News. 
or um, look at the fact that they, there is a wider Middle East conflict that is on the verge of happening as a result of everything that's taken place. Um, or this is an interesting one, Hashem said Yafin, uh, looking to be the one who's going to take over for, Hez, uh, for the Hezbollah leadership, which we don't know how that is going to uh, work out, but it's uh, very interesting. There's another uh, headline, uh, Sky News, that says, Decapitated and in disarray, Hezbollah and Iran must now decide how to fight or back down. And I can uh, pretty much tell you that if they fight, it's going to be the end of them, at least for a little while, which is very, very important. OK, and then understand the fact that Israel continues to verify for us that they did kill Nasrallah. And now Hezbollah is acknowledging it. Now Beirut is acknowledging it. Now Iran is acknowledging it. So they all know what happened. And it's a pretty significant deal. Now, why does all of this matter? OK. It matters because Israel is taking some very big steps to make sure that this never happens to them again. That's one of the big take-homes that you can bring from this. As a matter of fact, Bibi Netanyahu came to the United States of America, stood before the largest terrorist organization in the world, the United Nations. As he spoke before the UN General Assembly, he basically talked about the need to maintain Israel's security and that he was going to make the decisions that were absolutely necessary in order for the nation to remain secure and to be able to keep its uh, ability for self-determination and all the other things that go with the ground. And then basically he finished the address. It was one of the most powerful addresses that Netanyahu has ever done in that room. It was unique. It was um, uh, remarkable what he said. And then within seconds of the time that he walks off the stage at the UN, then the airstrikes begin. And of course, that's when Nasrallah is dead. It's very likely, by the way, that Nasrallah was probably watching Netanyahu from his bunker where he eventually perished. So all of this stuff is really interesting, and I think that this was done in a very unique style in that this was Israel's way of communicating to the rest of the world, we're going to do what's best for our country, and we're not going to be concerned with the ridiculous pressures that you've put upon us. Matter of fact, even in Netanyahu's address, which, by the way, we'll all go over together over the next few days, but even within Netanyahu's address, one of the things that he said, and he made it very, very, very clear, is he said, you guys have done nothing but attack us us as a majority. As a matter of fact, two-thirds of every resolution that's made in the UN is against Israel. And of course, they've taken lots of actions to make it miserable for Jews all over the world. And that there's something to be said about that, folks. I think it's really important that we understand it. So how does that affect things? Okay. It affects things a lot because there's still a lot of instability that's happening. Don't get me started with respect to what's happening in the Pacific and how the United States of America has abandoned the Pacific. And in doing so, they're headed towards the Persian Gulf or they're headed towards the Red Sea. Yet while they're in the Red Sea, the Yemeni Houthis attack them. And America just basically says, we're going to let it happen. We're not going to retaliate. You know, everything is all good. It's going to work out. We have become such a weak nation. And we're a weak nation because our leaders have give them, given themselves to wickedness. And so the implications of it all are pretty unique and actually they're pretty astounding and even when you stop to just consider for one moment how crazy things are getting like literally how crazy things are getting right now in the world in which we live as it relates to any part of the world i mean if you just sit right now and you look at that little area around uh the the chad lake area and you look at countries like niger and chad and nigeria and cameroon and the central african republic and all these little areas that kind of surrounded. It's amazing. The United States of America has abandoned, literally abandoned two bases in that area at the request of the warlords, at the request of the people who are doing evil. You've got a massive civil war that's happening in Libya right now that is in essence being ran by Russia. Russia's about to win it. That was all started by what happened in Benghazi by, of course, the uh, Clinton uh, uh, Secretary of State, the Clinton uh, State Department did that. And so now Libya has been completely destabilized, especially after the assassination of Gaddafi. And of course, Russia is proud to step into it to take control over what they want to take control over. 
when Russia takes over Libya and does what we know they're going to do, they will have complete control of that portion of the Mediterranean Sea. That means that whole southern portion of the Mediterranean is going to be controlled by them. Egypt will probably won't tolerate some uh, uh, offshore activity that comes from them that you might expect to see with Russia. But I can tell you right now, Russia is going to have significant control over the Mediterranean, specifically even when you go to the Sicilian coast, you know, there in Rome, or when you go to Greece, or when you go to any of these other countries, Russia is going to be at the place of advantage. And that goes to what we know in Ezekiel 38. But what's even more significant than that is some of the things that we're actually watching happening right now, even on Asian continents. Like you look at what happened with Japan recently. Japan scrambled an in, in, in indiscriminate, undisclosed amount of F-35s and F-15s to put a Russian spy plane at stop to tell them to knock it off because they were in Japanese sovereign airspace. And folks, if you don't think that has anything to do with anything that you're that you're dealing with right now, think again because it has a dramatic effect on things that are going on. It opens up the door even more for what we know is going to end up becoming World War III, and that is not going to be pretty, folks. That's not going to be fun. That's not going to be a blessing. It's going to be a curse. And what even becomes more significant than that is the United States of America is becoming even more inconsequential consequential because when you consider what's happening right now in our midst with the United States of America, you'll actually recognize that the United States of America has become inconsequential or is becoming inconsequential as a result of the sinful life that all of its citizens are living. And the darkness that we're seeing right now is uh, literally the result of the nonsense that we have continued to give ourselves to. That's why we have a president making these terrible decisions. He is part of the judgment upon the United States of America. Now, I hope that the United States of America becomes inconsequential by virtue of the fact that there's a spiritual awakening. And because of that spiritual awakening, a whole bunch of people are going to get taken up in the rapture, thus making the United States of America inconsequential. But right now, as we sit, it isn't even looking that way. So you have that going on. You have the United States of America not really wanting to get involved in anything that's happening right now in Israel or on the other side. But uh, while all of that's being said, their hypocritical leaders are still trying to help people like Ukraine and trying to fund in many ways uh, organizations like Hamas because they're not aware of the kind of insanity that's actually going on over here. And many of them that are aware actually think it's a wonderful thing, which is why they keep on doing it. And then, um, as I said before, going back to what happened with Japan and what happened with Russia with those indiscriminate amount of F-15s and F-35s and what they did to push away that spy plane, that's going to become more significant because it has a huge bearing on the South China Sea and what's going on right now with China and what's going on with the Philippines and China with many other nations, which is creating a whole belt of instability that's over there. Then when you start getting into the European continent and looking what's going on there, you're going to find all kinds of issues. When you look at Asia Minor, you have big problems. You're looking at Turkey, the problem that's going on there when you start looking south of Turkey uh, in the ocean and you actually look at Cyprus. Um, let's not even begin to talk about Beirut in Lebanon and the problems that they're actually having and what's what's you know come as a result of it. But everywhere you go, folks, what you're looking at is you are looking at what is going to be a massive powder keg that explodes. And by the way, let me add a cherry on top of that. If you are here in the United States of America and you have a child, that's going to dramatically affect you because if we enter into this world war, your children will be drafted without them even having to sign up for the selective service. Why? Because that law was passed into order literally recently as Joe Biden signed it into law. And what that does, by the way, is it opens up the same type of pulling in policy that Ukraine has had. Matter of fact, I bet you it was tested there in order to bring as many Americans as possible into the war, whether or not they're uh, capable of doing it, whether or not they have disabilities, whether or not they're male or female, they are literally reaching at the helm to get anybody that they can to be able to increase and enhance the war effort, thus being and living up to the reputation of warmongering that they have. So what does this mean for Israel? How about we just go back there? Because I've kind of gotten a little further away, and I just want everybody to understand, especially in light of Zechariah chapter 12, in light of Zechariah 14, in, in light of Ezekiel 38, what is the next step? What is going to be happening? I can tell you this right now. I can tell you that these terrorist organizations are going to die a terrible death. I am convinced over the fact that the position 
of Israel will go back to the position that God said they would and become a, an example to the nations. They're still an example to the nations right now, but some of those examples are not good examples. So when you look at all of it in its totality, you begin to see what's beginning to happen and what's taking place with Israel and everything that's happening on the war front right now and all the changes that are, that are being made. We are going to see some amazing stuff manifest. I bet you that there's going to be some kind of a skirmish between uh, Iran and Israel. Of course, Israel is going to succeed. They're going to do very, very well. But the other thing that we should also point out is the fact that as things get darker, as the days get darker, as we get closer to the return of Christ, there will be a massive increase in anti-Semitism, which is something that the Bible told us would happen. This is Zechariah 12, 1 through 3. It makes it very clear to us what's going to go on. But at the same time, the other thing that we're going to recognize is no matter how you cut it, God is going to protect his people. And that's important. So what happens in the immediate? We might see an attack from Iran. We might see uh, possibly, possibly Lebanon join up with some other fringe terrorist organization to try to send a message back. I doubt that'll be the case, but there's a possibility that that might happen. And I can tell you that what is going to take place is a massive movement within the region to create a peaceful situation within the Middle East, specifically within Israel. And it should change the way that the game is played because it will begin to prep the whole world for the environment that we know will exist during the time of Ezekiel 38. So all of this stuff is important. I think normalization with Saudi Arabia is not going to increase, but it's going to actually uh, 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 expl uh, explode. It's going to expand in a remarkable way. And the other thing that I should point, because this is also a really, really important point to go home with or to walk away with, is that Israel's not turning back. Israel's going to do whatever it takes to protect its general interest in everything that's going on, and they're not changing their minds. They're not moving anything anywhere. They're not doing anything differently. They are going to get more and more aggressive because they have to. It's really important. So the access of evil is disrupted. I think that's probably one of the biggest points to point out, just to understand that the network of Hezbollah is being disrupted. The head of the snake is next. We know that Khomeini is going to be next, but so many of the things that are happening right now is just unbelievable. And many of the things that we're watching would appear to have been inevitable uh, after looking at it for a little while, but even though it's happening, it's still a surprise that it's happening the way it is. It's happening so quickly, and the minds and the hearts of people are being blinded. Now, What's the summary of this? Why is this so important for us to know? First of all, it's important to know because we are supposed to be watchmen. We're supposed to be people that are paying attention to what the word of God says and to actually share that and to point it out to people who don't know any better. So that's one important aspect. The other important aspect of this, and this one I need to remind you, is so, so, so critical because it involves us putting our faith and trust in the Lord and knowing that because God warned us to prepare us for it, it also means that when it happens, happens, we can have confidence in the fact that his word is true, and we know from his word that we are going to be spared, that God is going to watch over us, that he's going to protect us, that the people of Israel will be uh, 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 protected as all of these crazy things are happening, and we can rest in the fact that we are on the right side of history because we're on God's side and God is on our side, and I think that that's really important. So, with that, there's some action items I want to give you. I think they're really important action items. Number one, I want you to pray for Israel. That's really important. I want you to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I want you to pray for all of the Israeli leaders. I want you to pray for Bibi Netanyahu, especially because of the political games that Gantz is playing and Gallant is playing. We need to continue to pray that God would give him wisdom and power and fill him with his uh, 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 just strength and grace that he would be able to understand the next steps that he needs to take in order to preserve the security of all of God. God's people, and that the Lord would put favor upon the nation of Israel and those that are associated with it and those that live in the nation of Israel, because more importantly, more than ever, we need this last thing, and that is pray. We need to 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 pray for Israel. We need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We need to pray for the people of Israel. We need to pray for the Jews. We need to pray for all of these people because there's so many things that are happening. And folks, pray for the Mideast. It's destabilizing in a way we've never seen it before. Pray for Beirut. Pray for these people that are players in all of this. Pray again for the people who are being motivated to this nonsense by the lies that they're reading in the Quran. There's so much to be said here, but folks, there it is. You've got the summary. My advice to you, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your, uh, uh, your antennas up. 
Uh, pay attention to what's going on, and I think that God is going to bless you. Now, quick note, I am this week going to provide analysis on BB's speech to the UN. I'm going to give you more information on the military operations and provide some analysis on that. And as well, we are going to start talking about next steps, what we should be expecting and what could be happening. And I'm going to give you guys the best education that I can to keep you up to speed on all of the events that are going on, because I believe in my heart of hearts that God will be uh, uh, he'll, he'll bless you as you seek to know these things. And I know that he's going to be with his people, Israel. And I know that he's going to keep you safe as you continue to look to the Lord to do what God wants you to do in the midst of such a crazy world. So there it is. You've got the summary of all the things that are happening. A lot more information is coming to you this week. Pay special attention to the discussion I'm having with David Tal uh, tomorrow. That's going to be a good one. And then lots of other material is coming out to educate you on the multifaceted uh, issues that exist within this. And I think it will absolutely bless you. Okay. So with that, let's do one more thing. Let's pray for Israel. Let's pray for the nation of Israel. Father, we just pray for the nation of Israel. We pray God for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray God that you would continue to strengthen your people, Lord, as, uh, they are literally fighting to maintain their existence. Lord, help us, Lord, to be people who will continue to seek you and, and, and pray, Lord, on their behalf, Lord. We pray that you would bless your people, Israel, that you would watch over them, that you would use them, that you would strengthen them, and that you would keep them. So, Lord, we love you and we thank you. Go before us now. Help us to stay involved in all of these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys. God bless you. I love you. Keep fighting the good fight and keep your eye open on the channel. We've got lots of great stuff coming your way. God bless you.